You're listening to the Race to Racer podcast presented by Race 92. Race 92 is a vintage-inspired racing apparel brand specializing in celebrating vintage race culture and adapting to motorsports today. Check out race92.com for all your racing merchandise needs. I'm your co-host, Aaron McTee. Other co-hosts, you may have seen walking out of Barbie Lines 459 with a big old smile on his face. He is Scott Bowie. Hey, Aaron. How are you doing? I'm doing good. So everyone's coming back from... Um, holiday hope everyone had a great christmas hope everyone had a great new year um do want to start out the show with a little bit of somber news i'm sure everyone has probably seen from now but um you know just t- terrible terrible news ken block um really one of my heroes growing up and you know i had to wear the one of my old sweatshirts kind of in honor of him but you know we just found out that he um passed away and got killed in a snowmobile crash so just man terrible that one really hits kind of close to home for me, and um, it, it's just terrible, right? Feel bad for his family, and um, yeah, just a terrible situation. Yeah, I, you know, it's it's crazy, right? You do all these dangerous things, and then and snowmobiling can be very dangerous, but um, and then you're doing something that you know millions of other people do, and and you you die like that and it's just uh man it's it's just gonna be pretty jarring um to hear things like that and uh and i know you were a giant fan of his and and he means a lot to a lot of people um and it's just it's it is sad it's very sad and i mean he's he's someone who really changed i mean really changed access sports with dc shoes and just changed so many people's lives um, you know, he sold DC shoes since then he started Hoonigan, um, which is a really, really big company. And, um, obviously he changed, I mean, I think he changed YouTube in, in a way as well, because Jim Connor was just huge. And he was really one of the first people to really kind of do that. And, you know, a lot of things that we do, um, you know, some of the other video stuff is really inspired from him. So he's definitely been a big inspiration for a lot of things I do, um, I mean, every year, usually me and my dad go to a rally race. We just saw him race this, this past year, 2022, at um, Ohio, the Southern Ohio Forest Rally. So um, so we just saw him a few months ago. But, yeah, it's just terrible news and just hate to start the new year out like that. Yeah, it is. It's uh, it's sad. Uh, and uh, like, you, like we were talking off air, or you may have said, while we were talking, uh, you know, just best wishes to his family. And it's so tough. And, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, it's just all you can really say. There's anything you can do. Yeah. It just seems really surreal. I can't believe we're actually, you know, talking about that. It's just crazy, but it just shows you how quick life can come at you. Right. How quick things can change. Yeah. Yeah. Life, uh, yeah, I mean, um, life just can change on a dime one way or the other. And, and um, while you may not know the effects of what happened, uh, the people around you do know the effects, you know, and then they're affected. And um, Yeah, it just, it really is a, a sad, sad thing. It just, in the older I get, I, I, I thought you were good. You get more used to those types of things. The older you get, and it actually is the opposite for me. You know, you just hate it more and more the older I get. Right. And it, it, it obviously depends on the situation. And I think when you've, like myself, like when you see someone, when you've grown up watching someone on TV or you've like grown up kind of watching their career, um, it's it's crazy like you know this is a man that did rally racing which isn't the safest sport in the world and you know you're going in between trees at 150 mile an hour maybe a little less but um and then you know you go out and get i mean i think we were having a conversation about this a couple weeks ago you usually do seems like people don't i mean you can you can get hurt doing your profession but usually playing around is what what'll get you yeah i i know like when my brother raced motocross uh, and he he rode pretty serious um, as as a pro am rider, and he got these worst injuries messing around, just playing out in the field or or like gravel pits or things like that. And it's kind of the same thing. It's like 
uh, for whatever reason, that just seems to be how it can be at times. Absolutely. Yeah, I know it's crazy. Um, but I mean, so our show today, like we said, we, we took a week off between, um, Christmas and, and new year's. Um, it was a good week kind of let all of us kind of clear our mind and, um, yeah, like we said, we're, we're releasing a, a show and, and ironically, um, our guest is actually going to talk about Ken Block a little bit, um, and that's Tanner Faust. So, you know, we're, we're kind of continuing on with the theme of um, jumping into the new year. Yeah. And obviously, Tanner Faust has jumped a lot of things. Um, I think a lot of people in the Indy area, anyone who's, you know, familiar with IndyCar racing would be familiar with the 2011 um, Hot Wheels jump that they did at IMS for the um, 100th running of the 500. And he was a yellow driver for Hot Wheels. Um, so, you know, Tanner is a great guy. It's really great talk. I think everyone will really enjoy it. Um, and that that's another guy that, you know, I grew up watching. And, you know, it definitely means a lot to me. And it meant a lot to me for him to sit down and talk with us. It's really cool to kind of talk to your childhood heroes. And, um, yeah, no, thank you so much, Tanner Faust. Um, he's definitely a high-class individual. So we really do appreciate it. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, he he really is the real deal as a person and as a as a professional. And uh, it, it it was it was a great talk, and I really enjoyed talking to him. And um, he's a funny guy, and he's very open. And and uh, and that's you and I kind of talk about this off air a lot. It, it's it's really interesting. Um, some of the people that you would think would be more down to earth aren't. And, and it seems like the, the kind of a lot of the bigger personalities we've had on the show have been the most down to earth people we've talked to. And, um, and I think you'll, you know, everybody will see that. Yeah. And it's, you know, sometimes it's people that you don't think would do a podcast or the ones that would do and the people that you think are the most, you know, apt to do one, um, won't do them. So it's right. It's crazy. And, you know, we've talked about this before, not going into it too much, but you know, you, you learn a lot about people and kind of where they are in their career based on, I mean, what we're doing really has nothing to do with their career, but in a way it kind of, it sheds light on kind of where they've right. the path that they've carved out of themselves. And, you know, just how people are someone like Tanner Faust, he understands how motorsports work and, you know, he takes time out of his day for a, you know, little operation like us. So uh, it really means a lot. And uh, yeah, it's just really cool. I think everyone will enjoy it. Yeah, I, I think everybody will enjoy it as well. Um, other than that, Tulsa shootout was in the, over the past weekend. Uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. I was, I had a list of names and stuff I was going to read off, but I think we'll just let that go by the wayside. Um, Emerson Axum, USAC regular, won the big event for the weekend. Uh, a lot of USAC uh, national drivers uh, were in the features for the upper division. So uh, Chili Bowl is coming up in two weeks, and we're finalizing our lineup for that. So that'll be good. Um, other than that, you know uh, – <laughs> Strangely enough, we also, right before we came on, uh, the NFL game was going on, and there was a player who was uh, severely injured and was down on the field for a while. So best wishes to him and his family uh, and his teammates. Um, just a shocking, stunning thing to see at a pro NFL, you know, an NFL game and a pro game. Um, so we wish them all the best as well. Absolutely. You know, it doesn't matter the sport or, you know, circumstances is definitely terrible to see um, something yeah. like that happen. Obviously it happens in all sports one time or another. And um, just been a crazy night. You know, first we see that and then, you know, five minutes later, um, TMZ broke the story about Ken Block. So it's just been a crazy night. And then we're only into J we're only January 2nd in the new year. So Kind of well, crazy. I'd sure I'd sure like to think that the bad news is over. I know that's I not so. realistic. Yeah. Uh, but I hope uh I do hope that the worst news is over for the year, but sadly I'm afraid it's not. 
Absolutely. Well, I, I don't know if we have that much more to really go over. No, I, I don't. So, That's for sure. Um, so, and I, I don't know, I think we may skip next week. I don't know yet, so, but the next one is probably going to be Johnny O'Connell, which we have recorded. So we'll release that. Um, we're planning on doing a Rolex 24 preview show like we did last year. So we're working on that. So we'll see when we release that. Um, we're also planning on doing a Chili Bowl live live stream that we've done the past couple of years. So, um, yeah, we'll keep everyone posted on that. And um, c- a couple of shout out on some of our sponsors real quick. First off, Racer Collect. Thanks, Patrick Patton, um, for being a partner with us pretty early on. Um, go to racercollect.com for any of your racing memorabilia needs. Also, thanks to Fast Times Indoor Karting. If you haven't, please go to our YouTube channel and check out some of our Proverse Joe's um, video series videos that we've been releasing. We just filmed one a couple weeks ago, and we'll be releasing that sometime probably in January. Um, but yeah, if, if you're looking for the you know kind of racing, if you have the racing bug, you want to know kind of what it's like to drive a race car, you can at least go drive a go-kart to Fast Times Indoor Karting. I mean, if you watch our videos, it's where the pros go and you can race there too and you can see how you stack up. So definitely check out Fast Times Indoor Karting. And um, yeah, it, did I miss, it, miss anyone, Scott? Uh, just uh, the good folks, the good guys. Uh, you saw one of their trucks out on I the did. road over the weekend. Um, great people. Uh, keep me Keep myself and my family warm in the winter and cool in the summer and and please if anybody needs any work uh, reach out to them other than that i really don't have anything else um just uh like i said before best wishes to everybody and uh thank you yeah and once again before we go just um you know thoughts and prayers go out to ken block's family um just terrible news and yeah i mean if you haven't you know please check out you know, some of the Gymkhana videos, I mean, like I said before, I mean, this is a man that did not only change the motorsports, but he really changed pop culture with DC shoes and, you know, a lot of the stuff that he's done. So, um, yeah, once again, thoughts and prayers are with his family and um, hope everyone has a great week and I hope everyone enjoys the Tanner Faust interview. Take care. Our guest today is an X Games gold medalist, a world record holder, a rally cross and formula drift champion. He has starred in multiple TV shows and is a stunt driver in Hollywood movies. He is currently racing in Extreme E with McLaren. We're joined by Tanner Faust. Tanner, it's an honor to have you on. I'm sure a lot of people have told you this, but you, the, a lot of the TV shows you were in were really a big part of my childhood. So it, it really means a lot to be able to talk to you, have you on the podcast. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. It doesn't make me feel old at all. The, uh, <laughs> whenever somebody says that. Uh, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great thing to hear. Of course it is. It's like, uh, I was in a time in my career where my whole mantra was all about making driving fun. And my, my career mantras have sort of followed my daughter's age. And at that time she was 14, 15 years old and all of her friends wanted a new phone, had no interest in learning how to drive, no interest in getting a driver's license. And it was so scary to me that I was like, oh my gosh, we're missing the boat on telling the story of how fun driving is like, cause you can't imagine that other people don't think of driving as, you know, being as much fun as you do. So, um, yeah, so I got involved in what I thought was the most fun sport drifting and rally cross, um, got involved in the TV show was fortunate to get involved in the TV show that basically celebrated the fun of cars, which was top gear and did stunts and did everything I possibly could to, to make driving fun. So how did you actually get interested in, in cars? So you grew up or you spent a lot of time in Scotland as a young kid, right? As part of a naval yeah. base. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Edsel, Edsel. Um, it was a Royal Air Force base that the Na- U.S. Navy rented. And as far as I know, it was an antenna. It was kind of all top secret stuff. And my stepfather was a cryptologist, which is like a decoder. And they had this thing called the elephant cage there, which was like this weird look like a cage that would hold an elephant and apparently that was an antenna i'm still a little unclear as to what that was it was like i think it's an antenna that listens into the ground if that makes sense because i think submarines communicate on some level with an ultra low frequency that goes through the earth um and so an antenna to listen to that 
could look very weird. I don't think it was an antenna that listened to things uh, above the ground level. But in any case, I think they were listening to Russian subs coming out of the North Sea. And um, but I got interested in. I think I was interested in cars. I mean, as long as I can remember um, toy cars, things like that, just like a lot of kids. Right. Um, I do remember the moment that I got interested in driving and it's a story I have told before, but it's, um, it's a car that is sitting in my house actually right there is an old 1976 912 E. And my dad had bought this car. Um, I was probably five years old. We were on Colorado Boulevard turning to Hamden in Denver. And it's kind of like a second gear sweeping turn. And he went around the corner really fast for whatever reason. And the tires kind of squealed. And I just remember sitting in these sheepskin seats that are still in the car right now. Um, like looking over my dad and he was like made some excuse about the tires being low and or whatever. And I just remember thinking that was just the freaking coolest thing ever. And I paid absolute attention to everything that had to do with cars from that moment on. And, and that ended up turning into a career. Like I think it has for a lot of people. And um, I mean, it was really like rally racing that was like the first type of racing you were actually really interested in. Right. Um, yeah. It was the first racing that I saw <laughs> that I drove. I didn't even really get money for it, but that I was racing in, I guess I could say. It wasn't like when I saw racing, I thought of Formula cars. I thought of Indy 500. I didn't have racers in my family. In Scotland, I did hear of this guy, Colin McRae, and did learn about some rally racing at that point. Um, and I always liked rally racing because you could kind of see what the driver was doing. Like in a Formula car or in a road racing car, you know, the car does its thing. It gets around the track. But with a rally car, the, the, the front tires are moving around as the car is like sliding into corners and stuff. And you could really see what the driver is doing, the action um, that, that's going on behind the wheel. Um, but, you know, when I first started racing, um, I, I came in at a club level in, in Colorado. When I lived in Colorado, I was in school in Boulder. And I looked into road racing and I drove a car called a spec Ford racer, which is kind of like the quintessential club racing road race car. But the more I learned about road racing, the more I realized how expensive that was and I had no money. So um, when I looked at rally, it was kind of the path less traveled. And there's an ice driving school in Colorado mm -hmm. that had a connection to rally racing. And so I thought, okay, well, if I could get a job as an instructor, figure out how to get some rally going, it's not that expensive to get into because it's not a lot of people that want to do it. And so that sort of rally kind of came to me that way. Um, but it turned out to be a great fork in the road for sure. You know, I, I think that's, uh, Aaron and I were talking before this and um, I'm. Because I'm, I'm late. I, no, I'm sorry. No. Oh, no, no, it was even before here. that. I got to take a nap during that time. <laughs> We'd already discussed you at that point. Um, no, I, I have a high level understanding of kind of your career without getting into the nuts and bolts of it, but, uh, not even nervous about that, but, <laughs> but I, uh, I, like I told Aaron, I said, what's really amazing is when you look at it, is you, you created this, you took your, it just created your own path. You, you, you've got this whole path that very few people have ever taken in motorsport, just the breadth and the width and, and, um, and the, all oh, so many different things you've done. And, uh, it is, does that, is that born out of the love of it? Like you just can't get enough of like, okay, I, I've done that. I'm going to try this because man, that, that looks great. Or, or, you know, something of that nature. A couple of those changes in direction happened that way. One of those was when I was in drifting and drifting was really one of the first sports that I got into, which where I, I learned about the business of motorsport and how, um, how it works to move the needle for the sponsors, not to give fun to the racers that get to go drive, which is what a lot of racers try to figure out. How do I get somebody to pay for me to go do this stuff? Right. It, drifting was really where I learned, okay, we're lowering their, mean age of their demographic and so now they have a younger 
fan base of, and they have a longer future because of that. So it's like there's, and, and every sponsor sort of has something different that they want. But anyway, when I was in drifting, um, I saw Marcus Grunholm doing rally cross uh, in a Ford Fiesta in Sweden. And it was just like, you know, in drifting is judged. There's always this, thing, sorry, there's always this thing in drifting where it's like not, it, it doesn't itch. It doesn't scratch the, like the, the pure motorsport itch that you might have. Um, because you're not racing against the clock, you know, you're still racing to a judge and you're racing to an opinion. There's something about that that leaves a lot of gray. Yeah. So you know that yep. basically every motorsport is judged in some level, but the, um, you get, uh, so you're always sort of hungry. I was always hungry to go back to a clock at some point. And, uh, when I saw Marcus Grunholm ripping this Fiesta around in this little 600 horsepower, all wheel drive thing, half gravel, half pavement jumping, it was like, holy crap, this has like every part of the most fun bits of motorsport <laughs> all in one lap. So, so yeah, in that respect, when I saw a video, I said, we need to figure out how to get Rallycross going in the U S how to get Ford interested in it. Cause they were not involved in it. And, um, so that was one where the fun factor started it, and then the business case kind of grew out of that, and it worked out. But sometimes it was also, you know, the business case came first, and then you realized you started to gain more respect for the sport as you got into it and started to really like it. Um, and that's just the part of being a professional racer where my income doesn't come from other stuff, really, and it didn't in the beginning. Um, sometimes you have to um, talk about what is the hot item for the sponsors that you do have and see if it's something you think you might be able to be good at and, and then go try it out. At what point in your career would you say that you were like just all in and you realized to yourself, like, I can actually do this for a living? That's such a good question because um, it's, uh, uh, if I think about it, I think it was a rookie meeting for Pikes Peak, the first time I did Pikes Peak, I was sitting in there with Stig Bloomquist, who was, you know, a rally legend, who right. was doing Pikes Peak for the first time also. And they asked, who here is hoping to make racing like your main vocation? And I remember raising my hand like, I, I don't know how that would work out, but I think that would be the plan. And uh, at that point in Pikes Peak, I also ended up getting a job at Pikes Peak International Raceway as a sales guy selling their like track signage. And once I sort of got that sales job, that's when I saw this is why people spend money on racing. Some people want hospitality. Some people want logos on TV. Some people want to just put a picture of a car that has their logo on their office wall. Every sponsor has a different reason. The way that you do it is you find what their reason is and then you give them an answer for it. And then those were the baby steps to making it happen. And as soon as those kind of, I saw those steps laid out and I thought, I can totally do this. It's only about five different pathways, um, you know, that the sponsors want. It's not an infinite thing. And, um, and the goal is to whoever writes your check is to get them a promotion. That's your goal is to just make them look good, make you as low risk as possible as an investment and make it pay off by getting them promoted. And uh, I mean, if you do that as a professional racer, then yeah, you're going to have a long career. Absolutely. So would you say the, so the drifting, I mean, you really did the drifting before rally, right? Like it was mainly the drifting stuff. It was about the same time. Okay. Um, rallying was actually first rally was like 2002, 2003 when I lived in Steamboat and then um, drifting the first half season I did, I think it was in 2004. Uh, it was a Swedish buddy of mine who I worked with Samuel Hubinet and he had, um, he'd graduated from just the dirty words that we taught him in English. And he, <laughs> he started speaking the language and got himself into like a Dodge program and had come up, got a, a ACR Viper to, to drift. And I thought this was the most ridiculous thing ever came out, checked it out. And, um, and the difference with drifting was that it was the marketing manager at the drift event, not the motorsports marketing manager. So at the drift events, you have the brand manager, the person who is responsible for, um, 
and changing the perception and the image of the company, big things, expensive things to do. At a racetrack, usually you have the motorsports manager who gets a drop of that marketing budget and their stickers on a, um, they're aligning with that motorsport, but there's their stickers on a car. They're looking for results, looking for as much exposure as they can get out of that drop. And, but because drifting was this lifestyle, the money was so much more available. The marketing guys talked with a totally different level of, of money than the motorsports guys at that kind of lower level. So, um, so I knew my heart was in rally, but I knew that I needed drifting to get a better understanding of the business and to accelerate the professional factor. So a company that you've had a, a big, really, relationship with, I think, for at least 15 years, and you have the hat on. Um, Rockstar Energy, kind of how did that relationship kind of start? Um, because, I mean, they were obviously a big part of every form of racing you've done. They really have been. I mean, it's been 18 years. And it's like um, <clears throat> they, let's see, it was 2006 X Games. Rally had somehow leveraged their way into being a car sport in X Games. Somehow meaning that Ken Block uh, who was a sponsor at X Games, loved Rally, and that one of his drivers um, and one of his athletes was Travis Pastrana, um, and Travis at the time was Mr. X Games. He competed in like four or five events every year. Right. So um, when they put together to have this kind of Rally exhibition that would be a, a class, you know, one of the, the classes at, at X Games, um, I went there, I got a call from Vermont sports car, um, to drive Subaru. They had three open class Subarus and one group N Subaru. So it would be underpowered, uh, and have not a lot of the fancy bits, but it was a good car. Um, my teammates were Pastrana, Ken Block and Colin McRae. So there now I'm teammates with my like this legendary driving hero. And at this point, I had really become to respect Colin because he just got into everything and he was amazing. Um, and uh, the test day was surreal. You know, I'm out there. I'm, I'm taking a ride with Colin in a car. I'm giving him a ride. He's asking me what this drift stuff is about. I took him out to the a drift track day that I had booked filming one of the Hogan's Heroes like shows. So we were out there with Hulk, you know, with Terry, whatever you want to call him, and uh, Nick, his son, drifting Vipers around. And then I had my drift car out there. And I mean, it was a, it was surreal, but um, Rockstar really had no opportunity or to be a part of that. They didn't have any motorsport, anything that they sponsored. There were six people at the company and they, um, they did music events. And one of the guys that owned a music magazine and helped them get the events was a big car fan, ended up becoming my manager. And he's the one that put that first rock star deal together. Oh. Yeah, we you talked know, him into drifting and stuff after that. We dragged him. I mean, believe me, it was an uphill battle. Those guys are rock star. I'm like, hey, this rally cross sport is going to be awesome. They're like, sweet. Can we do like a Lamborghini or a Ferrari? What are we going to do? I was like, oh, maybe like a Ford Fiesta. <laughs> and I mean, you should have heard the conversation when I told them we were going to be racing a Volkswagen Beetle. It's, it, <laughs> you know, it's a, it was a big education for them because they really just came from rock star lifestyle, some supercross, surfing, stuff like that. But um, they, they really had nothing in the way of motorsport for a really long time. You know, you, you kind of, to kind of circle back to that the business side of it for a minute you're just and like you said you had to you had to bring them in and kind of show them what the sport could offer them um and as when it comes to like younger drivers or younger people today uh the the rules i think the motorsport sponsorships much different much more aligned to to the things that you do uh, as far as like you know the promotion side of it and the you know, so much of the video and, and the interaction side of it. Um, I mean, what is, what is a rock star looking for? What, what, how, you know, what kind of return are they really looking for? Mm, it's changed recently. Rockstar sold to Pepsi and it was a single owner for a really long time. So it was like, you, you, you checked the boxes for, 
for that guy and a couple of people that worked for him, and then you were good to go. Now, once you get into big companies, if you're if you're looking to be sponsored by big companies that are agency driven in their marketing efforts, then you are starting to check agency boxes, and those vary based on the flavor of the the times. Right. Um, certainly, in any anybody looking for sponsorship. Anybody looking to go out there, the advice that I give, and I get asked about it quite a lot, um, universally, if you're getting started, then the best, easiest, most logical place to par- start is what value you can offer out of the car. Um, if you have, I mean, the easiest ones that agency-driven companies are looking for are people that have some sort of social media presence. So they at least get some minimum footprint. And again, all it is is trying not to get that person who signed your check fired, possibly getting them promoted. It's all a trust thing, right? So right. if they know that because of your social media footprint, they're going to get a minimum exposure, then at least they're not going to get fired if you if something doesn't go well, because you made sense on paper. Um, but if there's any value that somebody else is already paying you for, then that equates to value. Um, that's other than the driving, then that's the first place to start. And, and hopefully you get, you do that job close to the driving job and start to learn really what the steps are between where you are here now and where you want to be. There's, um, so like photographer, for example, is one of the few, there, there's been four or five people that I've talked to that out of thousands that have switched it into stuff where now I'm competing with them. And um, so one of those examples was a photographer who, you know, he, he worked for race team. He, he was a photographer, but he transitioned into doing race photography to get close to the teams, to get on the teams, to get hired by the teams. And then he got in close enough that he could understand what was going on. And then he's taking photographs of his track days. He's developing a social media presence with that. And um, then he worked his way into coming up with some sponsors to help him out. A lot of people also get jobs at racing schools. Eventually they coach a rich guy or girl who wants to go racing and endurance racing. That's the common thing, right? The Skip Barber method. Um, But for me, it's always been about, you know, there's going to be a dirty job close to the job that you want. And you just got to be willing to sit through that dirty job in order to learn how to get into the the job you're envisioning is your, your end result. But, right. you know, but, but just to, to your point, I'm so reluctant to give advice because it's so individual, you know, for right. me, the timing was right. just so right with certain things. Well, um, once you, once you don't fit all right. I mean, right. everybody has a different skill set. Everybody has a different personality. I a hundred percent. And I totally wish that you could just come up with a piece of advice that just works, you know, and um, all you can do is be there as proof that it can happen without starting with money. Because I think it's such a steep uphill climb sometimes that people are just like, well, it's not possible unless you start with a big check from the parents or, you know, something like that. The fact is, is it is, but all you can do is stand there as a representation of that and and then hope a little piece of advice actually works, but it's so individual. For me, it comes down to sitting next to a guy named John Bisignano on a chairlift in Breckenridge to, you know, drifting, just getting started in the U.S. to, you know, a lot, there there were a lot of little pieces to the puzzle that just fell into place there because, you know, taking advantage of timing. And I think that those, um, you know, kind of cogs to unlock your own career dreams are there for everybody. It's just not easy to see, um, to, to keep your eyes open enough to pay attention to when the timing is right and to act on it. No, I I think that's, I I think that's a great point. And I, I personally feel it's a thing where you got to be yourself. You have to be, uh, be willing to, like you said, uh, make, make things good for the people around you. You know, you can't be the only winner. They, these other people have to win big too. First, and, they uh, got to win before you do. <laughs> that's right. They have to win yeah. before you do. Um, and so I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, it's just really interesting. Um, I, I, honestly, in a lot of ways, it's just, it's basic customer service. 
I mean, you have to add value to the experience. 100%. I think when I, the very first road racing stuff I was doing with Spec Ford, you know, there was some BS involved and I tried a coaching service, right? So I would come up there. I did a scholarship thing with a guy named Jim Christian Racing in Colorado. He's probably still doing it. It was 3,500 bucks for 10 races. So that's $350 a race. It's free, basically. Right. You had to pay for tires. And it was everything I had um, to do this. I had, uh, and, and so I would, at the events, I'd run a coaching service. This is before GoPros were on cars, so people couldn't sit there and watch themselves. So I would say, hey, um, how you doing? I saw you out on the track. I run a coaching service, $120 a day. Um, and, you know, I, I come across potentially as a prick, right? So you had to be careful with that. And, you know, I'd, I'd only go to people that I qualified better than. <laughs> and then I'd, um, and just, you know, it was just one of those things. It's like, look, just follow you around one of the sessions and this and that. And at the end of the day, it was almost the same advice for everybody. Break a little later, maybe get on the throttle a little er earlier on the way out of the corners. And that covered 90% of it. But uh, because, you know, you're dealing, it's kind of gentleman racer at the club level there anyway. But um, I'd get four or five guys and that would cover tires and, and cover stuff. And, and you, know, you just sort of work your way through that, but also learn to talk the talk a little bit, which helped a lot in coaching later. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things they say as a parent, you know, like having a three-year-old like prepares you for having a four-year-old and having a four-year-old prepares you for having a five-year-old. It's just like a step process. Things the same in a career, like driving every little thing you get out of one kind of year and just sort of prepares you for some of the things you're going to have to come up with or do the next year. No, I, I make sense to me. Yeah. And um, when, when people think about like TV shows you're in, obviously top gear is probably the first thing that really comes to mind, but you were involved with some really great TV shows before that. I mean, really, how did the TV thing kind of start for you? Uh, that was in drifting. So uh, drifting, I don't know if you're, I mean, you were two, but the, um, <laughs> not, not that young i know I'm, but hey, uh, I'm, i just turned 30 so oh geez yeah you're up there you're already stealing your parents cars and stuff um <laughs> no it was uh <laughs> it let's see drifting it was probably 2004 2005 olivia munn was the host of the drift coverage and um is who's now an avenger and uh, it was on G4 TV, I think, or something like that. But then um, one of the directors was this guy who, who said he had another show. He was doing a, a car show and he was looking for like racers to maybe host it. And, and I'd given, you know, I was, a, uh, I'd given some interviews and he liked the interviews. And um, he uh, said, I think he could host the show. You just basically talk around. You know, I give way too long answers, as you guys already know. And that's, then you basically make a TV show out of it. And uh, so that's uh, that's what we did. That was for something called WATV, which was half owned by Roger Werner, who started, I believe, ESP. He was a, one of the founders of ESPN and then went on, I think, to be one of the founders of Speed Channel. I don't know. He's done a lot of stuff. But so we had a couple shows on Speed. We had... Uh, Supercars exposed, right? Yeah, we had Supercar. Before that, we had Redline TV. We had Import Racers, which I took the hosting over from Sal Masakela, who went on sure. to other stuff. Right. Yep. Uh, he went on to E News, and then um, and, and then, now is that the path you're going to follow eventually? Will you do E News? E -news. <laughs> uh -uh. I know. <laughs> I I'm not. I can't. I mean, Sal has a gift. I don't have that. I mean, I can talk cars and stuff. But Sal can get up there and just roll stuff off his tongue like it, it, it's silk, even when it's coming like through an earpiece or whatever. Like he, he turned it into, he, he was always a really just straight up good host. And um, I don't think I had that. But uh, it was, um, yeah, Import Racers was a, or not Import Racers, um, uh, Battle of the Supercars was the next one after Supercars with, Exposed. With Paul Tracy, right? With Paul Tracy. Yeah. yeah, that was the easiest show to make in history. Um, 
the producer would just be like, well, first of all, you had two car guys. So we'd get in the cars and we'd just drive. Um, so that was pretty straightforward. And then the top, the standups were like, Hey, Hey Paul, what do you think about Tanner's hair? And then he'd talk some smack and be like this freaking prepubescent pimply faced punk over here. I'm going to blah, blah, blah. And then he'd be like, what do you think of Paul says you're prepubescent? What do you think about that? And then somehow they just turned that into a show. It was incredible. It's so easy to make. <laughs> um, yeah. And then when Top Gear came around, they were doing a show for NBC and it was a full network deal. It was like our first get, we shot the pilot. Um, it was Adam Carolla and it was a guy, Eric Stromer and myself. Eric was a friend of Adam's, but the, but we had Adam and I figured out somehow I got in there and then, I mean, I didn't audition and everything, but then um, finding the third, we, we would, Adam and I would hang out with this third person and just do mock-up skits. Like we'd sit there and talk cars on camera and we had Jesse James. We had, so we had so many people, everybody can think of in the automotive industry come through there. And uh, I had so much fun working with Corolla. He was great. We shot a pilot and then that pilot never aired. Um, they, they had a show Knight Rider, if you remember that came out. <laughs> and then when Knight Rider bombed, they just figured, you know what? We were wrong. Fast and Furious was a fluke. Car stuff doesn't work. So cars are dead. We're bailing. Yeah. We're all going to be flying freaking helicopters around anyway, any day now. And, uh, and so they bailed on it and history channel bought the option for the name. And, and then we, we went out casting at Corolla already had another gig at that point. And, uh, and Adam Ferrara Rutledge and I made the grade and it was, we had a great time. It, it seemed like you guys just had, I mean, a lot of chemistry together and it, it, it doesn't seem like, and people say that about shows all the time, but it seemed like there'd be anyone else they could get that would be any better than you three together. Um, I mean, it's just, it, I think everyone just kind of filled each other's void. Right. I mean, you know, Adam was funny guy and always destroying things and Rutledge was also a funny guy and you were the professional, but it just, I, I just seemed to work very well. I don't know how it, it did. It worked. I don't know how it came together. It wasn't like, like if you were putting together a reality show, like we all have theorized that, you know, survivor or something like that, they're in there just thinking, okay, we need one person who's a fighter. We'll get a fighter. We need one person who is just, you know, going to, go crazy or you know they come up with different pieces of the puzzle to make a right. full entertainment package i don't think it worked like that i think we just we did a couple auditions uh i guess you could call them auditions we went out to a church parking lot we did donuts at a mitsubishi evo <laughs> and that was literally it and we just had fun on camera and i think uh, as um you know, hats off to producers and things like that. They can see when something's going to work and when it can't. So you got to give them that. Um, but our first director had it in his mind, unlike the other uh, Top Gear rendition that didn't take in NBC, that it wasn't going to be a remake of the British show, that it was, um, we weren't going to have a, a Clarkson and a Hammond and a May. We weren't going to like have a leader guy and then the two other friends. It wasn't. Um, and it took, TV is weird and you guys probably know this, but, um, in, uh, low hanging fruit, easy, you know, low budget TV, um, the drama is, is the easy way to get a reaction out of the audience. The tension, the cringy moments are the easy ones to get a reaction out of the audience. And I'd done enough low budget TV to know that if I tripped, fell, accidentally grabbed a woman's dress on my way down and pulled her dress off on camera that would have made like the trailer the everything they would have played it 10 times before every commercial and it would have been an embarrassing thing to happen but the editors and producers that would have been the tv gold that they needed right and so then you don't trust them so um with a show like top gear there was the budget tap proper post-production they they expressed to us many times that, look, it's in our benefits for you guys to be likable. So just be 100% you. It took, and it took a while for us to do it. Adam did not like being called the wrecker. 
I mean, would anybody like being called the wrecker? But the fact is he just wrecked something every show, <laughs> usually off camera, like a rental car. <laughs> and it was just like, you can't deny this any longer. And um, Rutledge didn't like the world knowing that he was just shockingly slow in cars. It just is. It'd kill me for saying that now, probably. But we have to just like, it's getting better, but have to um, embrace well, we are. I did not want to admit that when it comes to competition, I'm a bit of a cocky dick. And so <laughs> when when we would do uh, the stand-ups, sometimes the director would be like, yeah, that was good. Um, maybe just a little more cocky dick from Tanner. Okay, great. Let's do it again. You know, in a very polite uh, <laughs> British accent. And so, you know, we had to really embrace our roles in that and be ourselves really purely. And I think that's what worked. It wasn't like a, let's go find somebody whose character is gonna match with this person and match with that person. It's just once three people actually are natural and honest to who they are and, and what their motivations are, then it just <laughs> sort of, you just come off as friends. And that's what we are. We still talk, we still hang out whenever possible. And uh, and that's that's kind of what that show's about, I think. Well, I think you gotta have the other person one and you want the other person to win just as bad as you want to win in terms of, uh, you know, you, it has to be, you have to give to them. So they give to you so you can give to that person and, and everybody wins together. Yeah. When you're a creator and when yeah. you're a showrunner, exactly right. And not just go for that low hanging fruit. And that, That's that right. was important. And we, you know, that shows pretty simple. You get really, high ambitious goals and then completely fail but along the way you're gonna the struggle is gonna be funny and guys can relate when they watch the show and more than 45 percent were female audience members they laugh at guys trying to do stupid stuff and it 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 worldwide that show still has broken all the records not our version the uk version has broken all the records for unscripted shows i mean they had like 300 million viewers a week for a while there and hundreds of markets so it was um as a as a, That's uh, major. a full creative concept is unbelievable and um our show was in over 100 markets and uh so i was just racing in uruguay for the extreme e series and it was the third top show there for like seven years and so uh they they were huge fans of top gear down apparently my my spanish speaking self on the voiceover has this silky smooth incredibly deep voice <laughs> so i learned quickly just to keep my mouth shut um down there so they didn't hear my squeaky little voice come out but the uh it was so you weren't yeah. filming you weren't filming all those languages yourself? No, 100 100 of them. No. I only know 92. So there were some. Yeah. <laughs> no, that that was a great project for sure. And it was like you said a long process to get there, but um it was a lot of fun to do. How much creative control, I mean, did you guys really have with that? So for example, like when you guys would do a challenge and each one of you would pick a car, like was that actually you picking the car? Yeah, it varied because at that time I was racing a full championship in the U.S., a full championship in Europe of rallycross and doing some movies here and there and some commercials. And so I was on the I was on the road 310 days plus a year for a decade. And so sometimes I wouldn't get to the email in time. Rutledge and Adam were remarkably available for emails at that time. Now. Uh, you know, they're both very busy guys, but then it seemed like that email would come out and within three minutes, they would have chosen two of the three possible cars. And so I sort of always got what was left over, but mine was the easy one. Mine was going to be whatever the sports car or fun car is anyway. And that's all I wanted to do was have fun with it and have the fastest one that was the most fun to drive. And so it was pretty easy to pick mine, but I'd say half of the time I picked them myself. The other half, they already knew what I was going to pick. Now, one question, one thing I always wondered about Top Gear, did you ever, were you ever the Stig in any of the episodes? Mm -hmm. 
I was. I'm trying to think of. I know in one when we had my Ford Fiesta Rallycross car in the show, I drove. That was it. you. Okay, I figured. Yeah, the, the team that owned it wouldn't uh, have it on the show, uh, and yeah, otherwise. Um, and I think that's it. You know, the whole concept of the Stig is great because it neutralizes the, you know, the driving of the hosts. But um, also, you, if whoever is the Stig isn't available, you just get another one mm -hmm. who can fit in the suit, you know? And so mm -hmm. the suit was my size for that reason because when we started, the intent was I was going to do more of the duty. Um, but I got my buddy the job and they were very secretive about it to the point where Adam and Rutledge didn't know who he was for the entire <laughs> run of the show. Wow. And it really upset Rutledge, especially I would say for the first three years, he stayed in a different hotel. He came in his own rental car. He sat in a minivan off in the parking lot. And if anybody <laughs> approached the minivan, he'd put his helmet on. He wouldn't speak. Like they were very serious about it. And, uh, finally, after so much whining and complaining, uh, the producers agreed to introduce Rutledge and Adam to the actual state. And then they're like, nope, we don't want to know. We don't even care. We don't want to know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and so then that was that. And, you know, then it, but it, by then it had sort of turned into something where in interviews and stuff, they said, yeah, we don't know who he is. So I think eventually everybody kind of liked that. Okay. It really is kind of taken seriously. So, um, now he has a book, just like the UK. Ben Collins had a book. His name's Paul Gerard. There it is. I said it. Now he, <laughs> <laughs> now he came out a while ago, but um, yeah. And, and we had a we had a second stig also. I mean, if Paul wasn't available, and that guy, I can't say who he is because he still works for the UK show quite a bit. Oh. Wow. No, so you know something that interests me was is obviously we're kind of discussing it now in a roundabout way but all the stunt driving um like when they're when you're doing a movie or a tv show what are they what are they looking for out of a stunt driver i mean what i mean obviously you can drive fast you can do some turns stunts you know jumps maybe but i mean what i mean how do you, how does that even happen where you become a stunt driver um <clears throat> i think historically it went just through the hollywood passage of who knows who and who's in stunts. So it would be stunt guys. Some would get known as wheelmen um, in the stunt world. But um, the first movie I worked on was Dukes of Hazard in 2005. That director, Dan Bradley, was doing a rally race in that, not rally in the way that you and I might think about it, but more a race across Hazard County. And he was like, you know what? It's on gravel. We need to get some rally racers out here to do this. So he got Reese Millen to drive the General Lee. Um, I drove the car for Billy Prickett, who is the bad guy. I did get to drive the General Lee for the first maybe 15 minutes of the movie. But, um, and, and we did the deal. And it was, uh, you know, stunt people are incredible in that they are like one-stop shops. You get one stunt person can jump off a building, is a good martial artist, can backflip a jet ski, catch themselves on fire. Like all of that stuff is good with ropes, can ride a horse, you know, they, all the stuff that they can practice with other stunt people on their ranches or at stunt places. But cars are something that's more expensive to really practice at speed, like high-end cars. You can just get a Crown Vic with a handbrake and stuff like that. But even that is kind of expensive. You go through tires and stuff. Um, so... There, there had at that point there became this kind of level of it being okay to go out to the racing world and grab some drivers to come do the stunts. Um, our thing that we always did is we made sure if there was a big crash involved, we would duck out of that. Especially, I mean, didn't really want to do them anyway, the big ones. But the stunt people, that's really how they made their living. Um, doing those crashes and those big rollovers and everything. So you wouldn't take that from them. You would just do some of the technical driving and then get out. And um, that's, uh, it's been great. And, um, and then Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift came around, which was very drift centric. 
And at that time, there were really only a few people that we could get. Reese, Reese really headed that on the driving side, um, but he and I did all the 90% of the driving. Then there were a few weeks where there were some other cars added, but in general, it was a good guy, bad guy stuff going on. And um, if there were scenes with more cars, there were very few guys that were really drift specific that you would put in the car that understood camera, um, how to place themselves in the lens, how to get the shot that basically the director wanted, how not to block another car from the shot and have some camera awareness uh, and um, to do that safely with people that are just standing around looking in a lens, not looking at you. Um, and so, it, but the, that's really, those are, those are the skills really to answer your question is it's more camera skill than anything. Right. Um, we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording, but we were talking about the Indy 500. And the first time you were at the Indy 500 was um, when you were doing the Hot Wheels jump. And it's kind of funny, right? Because you're on top, on um, top gear, almost call it Top Gun, on top gear, um, it, you know, the whole stick thing was real secretive. And then you do the thing with Hot Wheels. And that was pretty secretive, too, right? I mean, no one knew that you were the yellow driver until after. Yeah, that was going to be kind of a secret because it was there was this whole mythology around the the yellow, red, blue, green team, and it was a cool thing. The Hot Wheels do, did that, and they did this whole live thing before the race, and they were trying to make it difficult for you to tell which ones of the stunts in this live, I think it was ABC production, were real and which one were, you know, CGI. And um, to kind of gray the lines between reality and, and fake. And that's what that whole thing was, was toys for real kind of a thing. Um, it, uh, then when we went there, I knew a lot of people in the paddock. I had never been to the Indy 500, but crossed paths with a lot of them over the years. And so we had to come up with a backstory on why I was there with my manager. And we were saying, oh, we're looking into doing uh, a run um, in an Indy car for the Las Vegas race. And after that weekend, we almost had a deal put together to do that race. A lot of people did. Pastrana almost did too. Yeah. It was one of those that we walked out of there like, wow, might actually have to go do this race in Vegas now. Wow. Which, yeah, which would have been cool. Um, but uh, that was the year that Dan Weldon died though. Yeah. And it was the, well, it was that the car he was driving. Um, was the deal we were going to do. But um, mm. in any case, the uh, the jump was a great thing. We had to had to wear the helmet all the time. Kind of felt a little bit like the Stig, really, because from the backside of the suites, you could see the top of the tower where we were starting. And uh, um, then they pixeled out my face, and they said they were going to announce the driver on their Facebook page. And they ended up getting like 400,000 new followers that day. Um, to find that out they did two billion impressions in that from that um jump and it was a big expense but i think a big success for a company that large that could scale it like that and then we followed it up with the loop uh at x games a couple years later where they got uh, two billion impressions in two weeks which i don't even know if those numbers apply now if people even talk impressions but back then everything was based on impressions but it was a big success um, and, from a marketing side. And I and I remember, I mean, obviously I, I was at the race and I was paying I was paying close attention to the deal because I, I was pretty young then. Um and I it, I mean it interested me and I knew <laughs> no, I, man, just it, sticking it to Tanner there, man. What, what you doing? Well, no, I was probably That's okay. I actually looked exactly the same and was probably the same age I am now. That's uh and you were four and a half. That's fine. <laughs> No, I been, <laughs> no, but no, I would have been like 18, so I really wasn't that young. But anyway, I mean, interested me, and I, I just remember, um, I think on that Saturday you were going around the track in the full, I mean, the full helmet and suit, and you, I think you did a two seater with uh, Mario. Yes. Yeah, and, I did. Um, that was that was awesome because Mario was involved in the Hot Wheels, uh, like the creative behind. He was the he wore this black suit, so he was one of like the original. Um, Hot Wheels test facility guys. The idea was it was a bunch of racers that just wanted to do fun stuff. 
and test the limits of cars and trucks more than their sponsors would allow them to. So they started selling toys to pay to build this facility to test this stuff. So that was the whole storyline behind that line of toys with the red, green, blue, and yellow drivers is they would recruit drivers out of motorsport to come test things to the limit. And um, so Mario was one of those guys. I remember getting in the car with him and he said, uh, just make sure you're second, you're the second driver. And uh, he said, the, whole, the best part of the whole thing is when the tires are warm, I'm going to take you full throttle around the apron. Once you're on the banking, it's pretty good and everything, but the best part's on the apron. I said, okay. So went in there, kept on making sure I wasn't first, passed somebody through there, got in there second place. And sure enough, right out of the box, tire, he, tires were warm. And that was the most impressive was the downforce on the apron when you know, when you're on the banking, you expect it to have like some good grip, but on the apron, it just felt like suicide. And I think he loved so, it. He scared the crap out of me. And this, this year I actually got to ride in the two seater with Mario. And I, I definitely noticed the same thing with the apron. That's the thing I was telling Scott. It's just uh, the amount of da- downforce. I mean, I have the video. I don't know. Do they have the GoPro on the car back then? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I got that well, video. I, yeah. It. No, they didn't have cameras. It was black and white then. But, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they had a they had you a version of it the out, GoPro. Like said, the they yeah. no there was a little guy with a real reel hanging on tight it was good <laughs> strapped on strapped onto the car <laughs> yeah yeah the um but no if you look at the video of, of the start like on the apron like my eyes just got real big because i was just like i looked i had to look up and i was like are we still on the apron totally yeah it was good uh, the good part of it you know then just a couple weeks ago i did an event with mario again and um, <clears throat> at the uh, Velocity Invitational, it's kind of like supercar get together at Laguna Seca, but McLaren was a, was a partner. They brought a bunch of cool cars, and Mario got into a Formula One car right, from right. 2014 or so, yeah. but a very, very fast modern car, which was such a cool thing to witness. Um, I got to drive two Formula One cars and uh, old ones, Senna's old car. And oh, wow. Prost's 1988 turbo car and I got to chase Mario around the track in Formula One cars I literally was screaming in my helmet it was so freaking awesome but how'd uh, you get that's one of those deals you're like how did I get here I know it's uh, you know that's the thing like that that extreme e series it's only five races but just being involved with McLaren opened so many fun doors to do some cool stuff cool content um come out to the Indy 500 like we talked about um, but then, yeah, get into those cars and, and, uh, I mean, I'm wow. a drift kid from Colorado. Nobody'd ever let me touch a, like basically priceless formula one car. It's the, it, the pro the, um, Senna car was the 1990 championship winning car where he punted Prost off for the win. And, um, so yeah, all my friends that have, that have been diehard formula one fans since they were, you know, four years old, just hate me now. But it, uh, it, it was such an amazing experience. So you mentioned Extreme E. Talk about that a little bit. You know, it's, it's, it's something that uh, companies are pouring a lot of money into. Not a lot of people are talking about, at least in the States. Um, but what is that, what's that experience like? I think, I think there's going to be a race in the U.S. If not this year, I mean, in 23, then maybe in 24. They're trying for 23, though. Um, but when I first heard about the series, I, you know, Volkswagen, who I've raced with for a number of years, was obviously committed to EV a very long time ago. Um, and I thought, oh, maybe this is a good way to stay on the leading edge of, of electric stuff. And um, looked into it. I kind of got turned away from it, but uh, had a potential to go down the road with the with Michael Andretti's team, who I was racing for uh, with Volkswagen. Um, they had a di- different energy drink associated with the female driver, so, and I couldn't jump out of Rockstar um, and didn't want to, so that went away. But the series itself, I wasn't sure what it was about. Um, but now that I've done it for a year, um, I'm, very, I'm, I'm really excited about it. It's, it's five events. There's only 10 cars. The cars all package onto a ship that goes around the world. 
Um, the entire paddock is inflatable. Uh, the, I mean, every media room, every building is an inflatable building. Um, so they could package them all on this ship. The ship has got a bunch of scientists on it. It's got a water sampling pool. It's got all this stuff that goes around and it does work at the different locations. Um, there are some effective um, parts of this that are off track from an environmental standpoint. Um, but on track, the way that the paddock is built, the small footprint, um, the hydrogen power that is used to charge the cars, uh, all the teams, there's no disposable um, cutlery or dishes or cups on site. All the team members all bring their own stuff and there's a dishwashing station. And there's a lot of things that are really interesting that you've never seen in any motorsport ever. But uh, I think at first, and I'll be the first to admit, last year, I wasn't sure, like, oh, what impact does that really have, you know? Um, but now, I think I understand that motorsport is in a transition. You guys certainly know motorsport's in a transition. Right now, if you were a manufacturer, you're going to be selling EVs. Would you rather go race uh, for $5 million, potentially lose, not really have any technology of your own that you're showcasing anyway, or spend $5 million on YouTube videos and make some content. Um, they're gonna choose YouTube videos all day long. And then, so that's the end of motorsport. But if you can have a sustainability side and you can have a, a, a side that's pushing sustainable technology like Extreme is proven to, then it's a play to sponsor that stuff. And there's a lot of companies, Apple, Google, Nike, all these companies involved, they all have a sustainability side where they need to spend a certain amount of money on sustainable things. And this is a place where they can go. So you mentioned that there's money being spent on it. That's a lot of what drives that, I think. But it gives hope for motorsport, knowing the teams are making money, everybody's making money doing this, even though it's EV racing. And they're progressing not just the technology of the EV cars, but also the way that motorsport can be a little bit more future proof as we move forward. So it's yeah. not for everybody, but I think it's proving a lot of concepts. Some, some of the things just aren't working and they just won't be back next year, but at least the series tried it. And, um, you know, but that's, that's what has to happen. So it is a cutting edge sport. That's always going to have some haters, but uh, I think it's a fundamental step to keep motorsport alive. And I love that motorsport, I mean, we benefit from motorsport over the last hundred years, the seatbelts, our disc brakes, everything about our cars is from motorsport. And if that kind of innovation just goes away because YouTube videos are cheaper more and more effective, then it's going to be a bummer. So I, I'm, I'm trying to be an evangelist for keeping motorsport around. Well, yeah, this this is a conversation we've had we we've had with a lot of guests, but yep. it's definitely uh, you know, I, I would be the first to be honest with you and say that um I I I'm just I think I think EVs I I don't know. I mean it, it obviously it's it's we're it's in the infant stages, so who knows what 10 years from now looks like, right? So it, it's unfair to judge it. I, um, I just, boy, I sure hate to, I sure, I don't know, man. It, it's just hard to think about going to the speedway and seeing electric race cars or, uh, something like I that. don't think it's about, I don't think it's about making all, it's just like, it's not about making all racing electric. And it's just like it's like selling EVs doesn't mean that everybody has to get rid of their combustion engine cars. You know, I'm going to have some fire breathing thing in my garage till I die. But um, there's a time and a place when driving an EV or something else makes sense. And I think for the manufacturers, EV, I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but I think EVs are tempting fruit, potentially a lot more profit margin once you get your battery situation sorted and you have eight models on the same platform. I mean, there's potentially a lot of profit margin in EVs. And I think there's a lot of manufacturers going that way, if not all. So if you want manufacturer money to still be injected into motorsport, then there's going to need to be more race. Well, they got to have a race. They got a reason to be there. Yeah. It doesn't have to be all the racing, 
but right. certainly more of the 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 race on Sunday, sell on Monday type racing. Right. Uh, will be will need to shift that direction if motorsport is going to continue. And again, it's tough if you don't have some sort of sustainable argument to the motorsport. Just showing, hey, EVs are fast. That ship sailed. That's how we all started these conversations. Was oh man, we can. Let's go out and let's drag race the world. Let's go drag race everything with an EV. It's going to be incredible. And um, I mean, now Musk has put out a thousand horsepower car that will beat anything that shows up to any light. And so we all know they're fast. That's that's right. That's done. Now you got to start showing other things that are interesting to people and compelling. And and hopefully motorsports there when it comes to the innovation side. Right. Yeah. But it's it is a it's a tricky time to be a motorsport in motorsports, working for manufacturers, not tire companies or battery companies or something, but for actual manufacturers. So, you know, it, it, it's in transition. Yeah, I I absolutely agree with that. Um, my last thing, two part question: You've driven a lot of cars. Favorite car you've ever driven can be a race car or supercar, um, and Second part to that is, is there any car that you haven't driven? It could be a supercar or race car that you would like to be able to drive. Oh, man, that honestly, you could ask me that tomorrow would be a totally different answer. And the next day and so on. Um, um, I mean, I've been really fortunate with TV shows and with racing to drive my dream cars over and over and over again and just to have that horizon change rally cross cars are some of the most fun cars ever to drive and uh the beetle rally cross car that we built with volkswagen it'd be hard to find something more fun but because i've driven everything sometimes i mean driven a lot in in that it's kind of in my bucket list it may seem like I don't get excited about driving much anymore. I'm even surprised myself. Sometimes I'll get into a car and just be like, Oh, that was freaking cool. That's awesome. All right. What's for lunch. And I don't mean to sound like, um, you know, but it's, it's kind of like a profession in some ways, Absolutely. um, more than just giddy. But uh, when I got into the Senna or not the Senna, the Prost, the, it's 1.5 liter, the four, the formula one car, 1988, 1.5 liter. They said, hey, <clears throat> um, we need to know if the boost controller is working on this. And we asked Mika Heikinen, who basically like swept the floor with Schumacher for a number of years and is a superstar, super stud, um, what the boost was at. And he told us he never went full throttle. So if you could get in and go full throttle and just tell us what the boost gauge says, that would be great. <laughs> so I get in there. It was like two laps before I could even look at the boost gauge uh, and with my foot on the gas because the acceleration. So it's impossible to describe. But anyway, he went to three bar, came back, told them that. And they said that was a thousand horsepower qualifying setup. The car weighed 500 kilos. And the feeling of when it hooked up in third gear, second gear didn't really have a chance, but there was enough downforce in third gear that you could go full throttle once the tires were, were warm. The feeling of acceleration is something that I'll never feel again in my life. And I've never experienced kind of the a tunnel vision where it's you are you can only focus on something so small in the center of your image picture. Um, and straightaways just get gulped in a second or less. <laughs> and it was just the most ridiculous feeling ever. So I got out of that. I mean, it took me a day or two to really come down from that. So long answer to a short question, sorry. But um, so that was probably my favorite driving experience that I can remember. One that I'd like to drive is probably a more modern Formula One car, just because downforce is fascinating to me. I have very little experience with it, but I'd love to learn about it and try it. Not for the sake of entering Formula One or something like that, just to experience that. I think it's mind bending. And um, yeah, I'd love to, to learn that limit. Well, you definitely have the right boss. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, the, boss. Uh, boss, not balls. Okay, I thought you were talking about balls. Yeah, no. No, <laughs> boss. 
<laughs> you saw where my confusion was there, right? Yeah, good. Um, yes, no, I mean, believe me, I think Zach is a betting man, so I, I probably need to start being more strategic with my 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 gambling. Yeah, he's he's looks like he's lost a little bit too. Yeah, he has. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, he's he. I think he likes losing those bets because he likes sharing experience of his cool cars, you know, with people. So, yeah, no, you're right. I need to push that. Because Pato made a deal with him. If he if he won an Indy car race, he would give him a test in a Formula One car. So I'm sure you could do something similar if you win a for a um, extreme E race, get to drive a Formula One car. Last two rounds were close too. So you're right, and you got to do the deal going in. So I need to make the bet before next season. We just announced we're going to do next season. Right. Yeah. So. So in Chile, we finished the line first, but it had some penalties. And then in the last race, we finished clean second. So we're we're itching at it to get the win. Yeah, should try to get an F1. Not a test. I'm not trying to get, you know, sure. super uh, points or anything. I'm just trying to just want to feel downforce at that level. It would be awesome. The um, Well, I have a couple of questions, too. Uh, the okay. first one first one's not really a question well it is a question uh how did you decide to get uh your degree like where did that come from and i i forget the exact name of it i was looking at it before molecular biology right there molecular, molecular cellular developmental biology yeah it's um it's one of the two pre-med degrees at cu where i went to school in boulder but i started school in uh in engineering that's what i i started there at their engineering school, aerospace engineering. Um, <clears throat> I think I just, you know, I just, I, 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 out of high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but that dude in the lab coat that had the little stick with smoke that came out the end, who would watch the vortices come off of cars and stuff. That looked like a pretty sweet gig. So I thought, all right, what do I need to do to do that? That's aerospace. Okay. So let's do that. Turned out to be very competitive and 50 ski days in my first year with was not a good idea, um, but uh, I just wasn't ready to be a good student and, and to focus on something. Um, so I took two years off. I got a job driving buses up in Vail um, and washing dishes up there and skied like crazy. And then I uh, got a job on a, on a lot in Boulder. Uh, I think it was, a, it was a Mitsubishi dealership. I was a car washer basically on the lot. And then the manager of that car lot whose dad owned it he ended up being my first co-driver and sponsor in rally racing uh eight years later seven years later so it's you know it all kind of comes right it's the whole the having the four-year-old preps you for the five-year-old kind of a thing it all sort of stacks um but uh biology just came natural my my dad and i think some seven generations are all doctors on his side um, I've been oh, listening wow. to doctor talk my whole life. Um, and it's fascinating. It was fascinating. And there was a strange connection between molecular biology and the way molecules interact and orbital mechanics, which is what a lot of what I've studied in aerospace, um, strangely similar, but I just thought it was fascinating. And I, and, and I, and I wasn't disciplined enough to do well in something that I couldn't convince myself was fascinating do you if you do you know what i mean like if i had a stack of subjects to to do homework in or something i'd always pick the ones that were fascinating to get those done no problem but the other ones i really had to work to spend time on just like any student i have a high school teenager now and i mean i see it in her it's really hard <clears throat> to to spend time and study things you don't think are interesting um but yeah, so by the time I graduated, I pretty much knew I didn't want to stay in indoors anymore <laughs> and uh, got the degree. And then I started working for an inventor who invented amusement rides. And that's where I really got kind of the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial bug about coming up with what's fun and figuring out how to make a living at it. Man, that's, you've had a, a hell of a life, man. Um yeah, it's apparently three or four lives. I mean, to, compared to Whippersnapper here, it's uh, no, <laughs> just kidding. How old are you now? Thirty. I'm me. I'm thirty. Yes, thirty. Okay, that's solid. Well, Sorry, yeah. Well, Tanner, Tanner, a while ago, he says to me, he goes, he goes, man, he's almost as old as you. You're 
53, he's 49. <laughs> I yep. knew that was coming. I knew that it's was coming. there. That's funny. <laughs> um, so, and the second part of this is everybody knows how brave you are, but people don't understand one of the bravest things that you did was in that video, uh, bucket list at the speedway, standing at that gas station by Long's Donuts, <laughs> because I have been in that gas station. You're not too far from uh, my house at that point. And uh, I've been in that gas station uh, at midnight one night getting a soda. And uh, a dude come in and threaten to shoot everybody in the gas station. And that's Things not I uncommon. Learned a while ago that would have been helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so people don't understand <laughs> how, what a brave <clears throat> man you really are. Was it, is it really that bad there? Gosh, it didn't seem that bad. Uh, I think it. I think at eight o'clock in the morning, it's not too bad. But and during the fair month of May, it's probably better eight, too. Eight o'clock at night starts getting rough. Well, you know that. So it wasn't. A, it wasn't a Taco Bell then. But if you go to uh, a mile and a half the other way by the Speedway, there's a place called uh, California Burger. Now it used to be a Taco Bell. That Taco Bell's where uh, Scott Dixon got robbed at. Oh, where he got robbed? Yeah, I yeah. remember that. That seems so strange. Then you talk to some people that. Like yourselves that are from around there, like, man, not that strange. No, it's it's not. Uh, it's yeah. it really wasn't. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so if you might know how brave you are, and also <laughs> you you mentioned uh, driving a bus. Now, of course, Wikipedia tends to exaggerate sometimes. Did you or did you not get fired from driving a bus at one time in your I life? I did. I did not know that was in Wikipedia. That's um, yep. It's yeah, on there. <laughs> only job I've gotten fired from. Uh, I mean, I, I was too young to pick up passengers, so I was a bus washer. So what that okay. meant was, and this was in part of my hiatus from school. Um, so I was 18, just, uh, and, and so I would, uh, let's see, I, I worked from four, uh, no, from six in the evening to four in the morning. We would take the buses through the bus wash at Eagle Vale, drive them back to um, the Beaver Creek West lot. The guy there would fuel them up, and then we'd go park them in Avon. That was our little route. So, but after two thirty, the bars let out. We would start picking up hitch hitchhikers, <laughs> and there were only four of us that worked the late shift. So we would polish the buses off real quick, get them through their rotation there, and then we'd just take a bus to a party. Um, sometimes we'd move a whole Mardi Gras party from one apartment to the next. We could fit like 50, 60 people in those things. <laughs> but um, one night uh, we were at the Beaver Creek West lot. And um, I used to love after a snow going out there and uh, getting some donuts going in these buses. They were the big ones with the big like <laughs> saucer table wheel and then the front tires are behind you, you know? Yep. And so three guys would be in the back and you just start spinning it around. And in the driver's seat, it would actually kind of like suck you around backwards because the front tires were behind you. It was just hilarious. And then the snow would come over the top of the bus, you know, where the tires going through the powder and stuff. Oh, it was, it was awesome. And uh, probably just in <coughs> hindsight, it was, it was probably not that great. But in any case, my boss was in the parking lot and uh, asked what my 20 was. I said, I'm in the Beaver Creek West lot. And he said, so am I. And uh, we all got fired, actually. But um, so that was the only job I've really been fired from. But it was worth it, I think. It was training. It was like uh, it's a whole training exercise. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where you learn how to drift a bus. Because in that episode of um, Top Gear, you, well, I don't know if you actually drifted. You got close to drifting, at least. It was. So that's where that came from, was that conversation. Oh, really? And okay. they're like, we got seven minutes to fill on the show. Um, and I and I kind of thought we could start doing some things in Top Gear that were like segments, kind of like um, Saturday Night Live would have like a couple skits that would repeat um, the ladies man or whatever, you know, those would go until they stopped rating very well and then they would change them different ones, right? Um, and so one of them I wanted to do was Will It Drift, which would just be trying to drift different stuff. and. and it never really worked out to do it like that. But when they had those seven minutes to fill in the show, they're like, let's just come up with a will it drift thing. We'll just hire a bunch of stuff. And of course, where we did it was El Toro Marine Base, which is uh, military grade concrete. 
it doesn't matter what you put on this stuff. It's grippy. Like it's so, we've got so many gnarly, like uh, it's so coarse. So we put soap down, we put everything down to try to make these things slide without flipping over. And it still was so grippy, we really couldn't do much. But um, Adam stayed in the bus, which I thought was pretty brave. Because <laughs> it, like, you know, in a city bus, when that thing is hopping up on two wheels, it's a scary, scary feeling. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I mean, the, I, the, I've never been on one when that happened, but I assume it is a. You just assume, yeah. Once you get up to about 0.8 G's lateral in a city bus, you know you're busted, you're in trouble. Right. But the limo was fun. That one we could have fun with because that one was going to be safe. And that was all very accurately done. I literally took off before Rutledge could get his seatbelt on. Right. And he was genuinely scared out of his mind. The camera guy was back in there also. Camera guy had his feet up on two walls, just hanging on. And uh, Rutledge is trying to pull the thing. And I'm swerving around so that the seatbelt lock won't let him have the seatbelt. And then just chucked it into a 360. And um, that footage makes me laugh still because Rutledge is just so funny. That's so funny, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, do you have anything else, Scott? Hey, I don't. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Uh, Got it, guys. Hope, hopefully, if you ever come back to Indy, we'll uh, get to meet each other. And who knows? Maybe you can take uh, Aaron. I think uh, I think if Aaron in one life could actually uh, ride in, in the two seater with Mario and drift with you, I think Aaron's life would be perfectly made. That, well, I've got a drift taxi. Optima and Rockstar still in Yokohama. They still sponsor this thing to come out to different events. We use it for raising money for charity, but could be a charitable thing for Aaron also. And we, uh, but that and it, it, these events, like you know, like I mentioned, that hypercar event. We go out to Laguna Seca. People will bid on on the seats. We we've, we've raised over twenty thousand dollars in a day. Um, oh, that's for, great for Make-A-Wish, just taking people around in this car. So, But if I bring that out to Indy, I'll make sure to hit you up, Aaron. It's super fun. I would I would, I would, really appreciate that. That would be pretty cool. Um, we actually we actually do a segment on our YouTube channel. It's a video series, called, and it's kind of inspired by something you guys did on um, Top Gear. I keep trying to call it Top Gun. It keeps sliding. Top Gear. It's a great movie, though. It's a great movie. It's on my mind all the time, trust me. <laughs> so you guys did the... <laughs> <laughs> right. So you guys did the fast, the big car, or small, small car, fat, big star. So we do big something star, similar. small car. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So we do something similar at an indoor go kart place called Pro vs. Joe's, and we race um, pro drivers. So it's it's kind of similar. We keep track of the time. So I mean, that was you, completely inspired. Do you put a weight penalty on there? Do you no. match Would the you, weight? Did you talk to Tyce Carlson? No. I mean, it's the same story every go kart track, though, isn't it? Ty, that's it Tice is. was Tice was asking the same questions, and now he can't do it surprisingly. So I, yeah, I just wonder, no, right? He can't do it. That's so right. then you said no, no, no weight balancing. He was trying to add weight. There's no balance of power in the uh, go kart deal. I've showed up at things, um, you know, meeting people on go kart track, and a guy wants to introduce his kid, nine year old or whatever. Hey, how's it going? And then kid goes out there and go go karting and just smokes you right in a in in these rental carts and he's like hey you need to get my kid sponsor it's like man it's, you know it's only got about a hundred pounds on anybody else here and right. yeah so it's uh yeah that's why it's when you're dealing with go karts a hundred pounds is a big percentage that's funny well <laughs> but yeah if i'm in town let's do it it'll be good yeah, no, that would that would probably be. I don't know anyone else that I would do that with. I would be more excited about. So that would really mean a lot if you ever have time for sure. You probably don't come to Indy that much, but McLaren is an Indy. At least the Indy car is, and they're building. They're building a new facility, right? In Indy, they I believe. Are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other side of town, I guess, but it should be good. It's supposed to be beautiful. Yeah, no, I'll let, I'll definitely hit you guys up if I get to town. I'm I'm sure I'll be out there next year at some point. Perfect, that'd be great. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Like Absolutely. I said. It means a lot to have you Thank on, you. and like we were joking about, I grew up watching you on TV, so it um, really means a lot. So thank you so much. Cool. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it, guys.